Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Corapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. Uh, this week, uh, we're going to talk about St. Teresa of Avila, uh, another uh, um, little uh, part of our series in the making, Lessons from My Favorite Saints. In this series, we try to uh, uh, choose uh, some of my favorite saints and the lessons that we can learn uh, from their lives. And, and there are lots of, a lot of lessons we can learn from the saints. Uh, before I get into that, I'm just going to diverge for a few minutes um, because um, the state of the economy in the United States is on everybody's mind and it's beginning to cause uh, a lot of people uh, suffering. And uh, of course, that, that we're very sorry uh, when, whenever people have to suffer like that. Uh, but people have uh, been asking me my opinions and you know, um, I, the society we have today, I guess you're supposed to have an opinion on everything. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really have um, an opinion on a lot of things, but on some things I do. But when it comes to personal opinions, you know, uh, that's not what we go by. Uh, my opinion or somebody else doesn't really matter. R what really matters is objective truth, and it's not always easy. Uh, in um, in some of these matters to know uh, what the best way to proceed is. Um, of course, we're going to have a lot of um, commotion now. We're um, almost, uh, I, re I received my ballot today uh, in the mail to vote in the presidential election. I always end up uh, voting about two, three weeks before uh, because I'm almost always gone on election day, so I I do uh, a mail-in ballot. Um, the economy, of course, is going to be a huge factor, and it is important. Um, but let me just tell you something. There's nothing, nothing, nothing more important than the fundamental life issues. Now, many of the bishops have told us this. Uh, the economy, the war, this, that, and the other thing, uh, taken all together, they aren't as important as these issues of life. Uh, I'll give you my personal opinion. You don't have to accept it. The reason we are in the mess we are in in the United States is because we are a country that has espoused genocide. Yeah, genocide, abortion. That's genocide. Tens of millions of innocent human beings murdered, executed in the most cruel fashion, and we call it a medical procedure. It's homicide. That is the teaching of the church. The church holds that a single abortion is a homicide. Tens of millions of them constitute genocide. No country that has genocide, basically as the law of the land, can be pleasing to God. So I'll say this. No matter what we do, we will not be able to do anything right from this point forward until that stops until abortion on demand is removed, outlawed in the United States of America. Uh, it is a heinous crime and nothing will go right in this country until we repent of that and remove it totally from the scene. Uh, you know, they come up with all these ideas, why the economy went bad. Oh, this happened, that happened. It's the Republicans' fault. Oh, it's the Democrats' fault. Nothing will go right with the economy or anything else until we get right with God. And that means on the five issues that are basically intrinsically evil, uh, abortion, euthanasia, same-sex marriage, fetal stem cell research, human cloning. Those things are evil in themselves. They can't be done. And of course, the most heinous, the worst of all, is abortion. Until it goes, don't expect anything good. Don't expect that your 401k will grow like you want it to from this point forward. Don't expect that the bailout will work. It won't. Don't expect that anything the government does will work. 
It won't until we get rid of murder on demand. That's that commentary. Let's jump into the talk on St. Teresa of Avila, one of my very favorite saints. Uh, her name in religion was St. Teresa of Jesus, um, commonly known as St. Teresa of Avila. She's the foundress of the Discalced Carmelite Reform, uh, OCD, Order of Carmelites Discalced. Uh, very um, austere uh, renewal of the Carmelite Order. Um, and, and, you know, I could, there's so much to say about St. Teresa. But she is one of my very favorite saints. Uh, she's so human. She's easy to get along with. She's easy to understand. And, of course, she's a doctor of the church. She is one of 33 doctors of the church, only 33 in the entire history of the church. She's one of them. Uh, she was named a doctor of the church for her profound teaching on the spiritual life. Uh, and she does it in a way you can understand. That's what I like about her, is to uh, steal one of her expressions. Uh, you know, to, when you read St. Teresa, uh, you don't have to break your head uh, to understand it. She's very understandable, uh, down to earth, uh, and we profit so much from her simple teaching on prayer. Uh, basically, the teaching of St. Teresa is the teaching of the church. Uh, and it, it starts with the, the meaning of human existence. Why are we here? Um, God created us uh, to enter into union with himself. Uh, as the old Baltimore Catechism used to say, um, God created me that I might know him, love him, and serve him, that I might be happy with him in heaven for all eternity. And all the profound spiritual theology, the writing, writings of the great masters of the spiritual life, it really all comes down to that. Why did God create us? Well, God created us to enter into union with himself. Uh, union with the Trinity is the reason, uh, the objective of human existence. And St. Teresa uh, lived this and, and taught this. Um, she chose the better part, uh, to use that phrase from the gospel. You remember uh, uh, the two sisters, Mary and Martha. And, um, and when Jesus came to the house, um, Mary just sat at his feet. Martha was bustling around, doing all the work. Uh, Martha was uh, no doubt making all the preparations for a meal, you know, all cleaning, cooking. That's a, that's a, that's a good thing, uh, you know, that kind of service. That kind of work is excellent. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, hanging on his every word. She just wanted to be close to him. You know, Martha compared, or rather Martha complained uh, to Jesus about, uh, about her, her sister Mary. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and concerned about many things. One thing alone suffices. One thing alone is really important. Mary has chosen the better part, and it shall not be denied her. The better part? To sit at the feet of God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. In other words, all the anxieties and concerns of everyday life, all the noise in contemporary society, all the worries about the economy, uh, about, oh, how am I going to keep my job? I, mean, that, that, I understand. Those are worrisome things, and I sympathize with that. Um, but, but, remember this. There is still a God in heaven. And all these things that one day in the future, in eternity, are going to pale into absolute insignificance. Remember, there is still a God in heaven. And he loves you. And the purpose of our existence on the face of the earth, it's, it's a test. That's what this is. This is a test, a test to see if we're going to do what God wants us to do. And that, some of the lessons St. Teresa taught us in her life, um, you know, St. Teresa didn't try to be somebody else. She was herself. Now, you've got to do that too. Be yourself. Don't try to be some, some saint you read about in, in the book. You try to be a saint to be sure. But you're, you're unique, precious, unrepeatable. And so accept that. God knew you, called you by name from all eternity. And so you, you've got to be yourself. Uh, St. Teresa was fully human. She had a sense of, 
of humor. She was down to earth, easy to talk to, easy to listen to. Um, she was fully human because she was fully immersed in Christ. And, that, and that's, that's really how you become fully human, uh, is to be fully immersed in Jesus Christ, who's not only true God, but true man as well. Um, St. Teresa loved the church. St. Teresa loved the church, and she loved priests. This is one of the lessons we can learn from her life. Love the church. Love Holy Mother the church. Oh, you may encounter individuals in the church um, that you don't like, that you don't agree with, that maybe they even hurt you very badly. Uh, Don't allow that to separate you from the body of Christ. Why would you allow any human being, any priest, anybody, to come between you and Christ in his church? Uh, It just doesn't make any sense. Now, St. Teresa understood a very fundamental reality. As the priest goes, so goes the church. If you have excellent priests, you will have very good lay people. If you have good priests, you'll have pretty fair lay people. If you have real mediocre priests, well, 80% of the people won't even go to church anymore. I'm afraid that's what we have in North America right now. And we wonder why we have problems. Listen, among Catholics, they they tell us that 80%, 75-80% to of Catholics in North America don't even go to Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. And we wonder why we have problems. You wonder why, why uh, the dollar has lost uh, something like 17% of its value in less than 10 years. You wonder why your 401k plan is shrinking. You wonder why the government can't seem to solve the problems. You wonder why wars keep multiplying all over the face of the earth. That's why we're estranged from God. Lip service isn't true worship. A lot of people claim to be Christian and Catholic. They're not. These people that claim to be Catholic or Christian and support abortion. They're not Catholic. They're not Christian. That's, a, that, that's totally impossible. You, that is uh, an antithetical position to Christianity. To take a position that you can kill innocent life, I say innocent human life, which is abortion is taking the life of an innocent human being. You can't do that. You can't do that and be Christian. And anyone who does that is making evil proliferate. Uh, You don't want to collaborate with that in any way. So, love the church. Love the church, our Holy Mother. St. Teresa founded the reform of the Carmelite order, the Discalced Carmelites, uh, to pray for priests. Simple as that. Why? Because she knew that if the priests were holy, that would lift up the church. And if the church then functions in accord with her sacred mission, then the world will be lifted up. If you don't have holy priests, then the church will lack power. The church will be limping along, um, hard-pressed to perform her mission. In the world. Then what happens? Then the world begins to sink into hell under the weight of its own iniquity. And that's what's been happening in the last decades. St. Teresa prayed, prayed, and all her sisters prayed for priests. We must pray for priests. When priests are worldly, when priests are not concerned with spiritual perfection, uh, holiness of life, then the church is weakened in her members. And when the church is weak, then the world becomes very weak. She frequently was misunderstood, persecuted, even in the church. Now, don't be misunderstood, persecuted, or maligned for the wrong reasons. (laughs) You know, sometimes people do things that uh, are, are... are not so good. They're they're, uh, reprehensible, in fact. And uh, they're maligned for those things. Well, that wasn't the case with St. Teresa. St. Teresa was a good and holy person. She was just misunderstood quite frequently by some of her confessors, 
um, authorities in the church. But she was humble. She remained humble. Uh, and that's a, that's a lesson. I'll come back to that. It's so important, humility. Now, St. Teresa gave us, throughout the course of her many writings, she gave us some conditions for growth. Um, uh, Father Thomas Dubé, who's a wonderful Catholic uh, priest and author, uh, wrote a great book called Fire Within, published by Ignatius Press. I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful uh, work on the spiritual life, uh, uh, lessons from St. Teresa, St. John of the Cross, in light of the Gospel, and so forth. But uh, Father Thomas Dubé kind of um, um, collected some of these, synth- synthesized some of what uh, St. Teresa really teaches us. Uh, and, and I'm going to go through uh, some of these elements from, from St. Teresa's teaching, some of the lessons from this one of my very favorite saints. Number one, conformity to God's will. You must live your life with the attitude of wanting to do God's will. Um, you know, if you could get that one right, all the others would fall in place. Um, most of the time, we want to do our will. And we kind of hope that that will be in conformity with God's will, but we put ourselves first. You will never make spiritual progress so long as you do that. Uh, God's will be done. Every time we pray the Our Father, you know, thy will be done, uh, you have to mean it. You have to mean it. Uh, sometimes God's will is mysterious, uh, incomprehensible. God's ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. We just have to, we have to accept that. We may not understand it, but we have to accept it. Um, we live in a very, very difficult period in history. Uh, I believe that the, these are pivotal times. I believe that because of what's happened in the last 50 years or so, uh, an escalation of immorality, um, religion really has been, in many cases, downplayed. We've tried to evict God from our society, um, you know, under the specious pretext of, 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 of freedom. Uh, we've allowed all kinds of evils. Um, you know, they, they, won't let, they won't let children pray in school, and, and yet uh, they have lectures on gay lifestyles in schools. Um, they, they, they won't allow uh, signs of our religion in public. In, in other words, God has been evicted from our society in, in a very real way. Uh, that's the kiss of death. You know, you want to evict God, God's enemy will come in. Nature abhors a vacuum. And so does supernature, supernatural things, preternatural things. You know, if you, if you don't want God in society, then Satan will be prevalent in society. And so it is. So it is right now. Um, St. Teresa uh, realized that first and foremost, we, ha- we have to want God's will in our own personal life. Secondly, we, you know, your holiness, holiness of life, doesn't depend on where you are. This happens sometimes in religious congregations. Um, uh, somebody will be in a religious order, and, well, they don't like somebody there. They don't like certain practices. They go, if I could just move over here, then I could really be a saint. Wrong. Well, uh, you know, I'm at, at home... Uh, my husband is not really a very religious. Oh, my wife doesn't understand my religion. If well, maybe I better get a divorce and I'll have a better chance of being saved. Wrong. Bloom where you are planted. That's what Saint Teresa taught. That's one of the lessons we can learn. Look, um, you've got to play the hand you're dealt, and that's how you become holy. Some people are dealt a rather poor hand. They may be born blind or deaf. They may have all kinds of challenges in life. Um, Oh, if only I could be like everybody else, I could do so much better. Yeah, you may lose your soul. (laughs) God knows what you need. Play the hand you've been dealt. Bloom where you are planted. Holiness of life doesn't depend on mere external circumstances, okay? Go beyond minimalism. 
You have to go beyond minimalism to be holy. Oh, but I go to church every Sunday. Great. Well, that's a precept. You have to do that. That's bare minimalism. You know, you've got to pray. You've got to cultivate a personal relationship with the Lord. Uh, Draw close to his mother. She'll draw you closer to Jesus. You have to work at it. You know, pray the rosary every day. Read the Bible every day. Well, I don't have time, so five minutes. Start with five minutes and then ten. Let me tell you something. If you put first things first, other things are more likely to fall into place. If you've got chaos in your house, because everybody's running in a different direction. If you've got financial chaos, uh, God first, everything else second. And you wait and see. Look, God will be on your side. He'll sort things out. He'll give you wisdom to make good decisions. Let me tell you one thing the politicians and elected officials today uh, and the appointed officials, let me tell you something that they don't have in most cases, wisdom. They don't have any wisdom. Where's wisdom come from? God. It comes from God. If a society is estranged from God, God eventually will turn it over to his own base desires and allow that society to self-destruct. And that is what is in process. And so we have to do what we can uh, to, to fight against that, to overturn them. You have to be purified from your faults. Um, stop sin first. Get the mortal sin out of your life first, certainly. But then gradually, as you move toward perfection, you have to be purified of your faults, even the little things. Um, you know, maybe you'll use bad language sometime. Make an effort to overcome that. Whatever it is, you have to gradually, gradually be purified from your faults. Sometimes, if you don't do it on your own, God will do it for you through very, very uh, effective trials and tribulations, which tend to humble a person uh, and make it a little bit easier then for them to overcome those, those uh, defects. Don't be too careful or too timid, <laughs> St. Teresa said. You know, when you're doing penance, now you've got to be prudent. Don't, don't be imprudent. But St. Teresa said, oh, some people, you know, they, they're, uh, they're worried about, oh, well, I'm going to do too much penance. You know, I might hurt myself. She said, those people are no, in no danger of killing themselves. Take my word for it. <laughs> you know, they, they fast. You know, they say, oh, well, I don't want to hurt myself. I could fast. I could faint. I could get, you know, go into shock or something. And St. Teresa's response would, would be to laugh. And shake her head and say, look, and those people are in no danger of death. They're not going to kill themselves through penance. So don't be, you know, be prudent, but, you know, don't be too careful so that you're, you're afraid to, uh, to make a sacrifice for the good Lord. You will receive what you are disposed to receive. In other words, God gives to each individual person what he's ready for. God does not force holiness upon anyone. Uh, he allows people to, ha- to have their space, take their time, to progress in, in their own fashion. Um, but you have to do this. You know, when you correspond to a grace, you're given another grace. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say your guardian angel, and, and the guardian angel is very active in this whole process of holiness. Let's say the guardian angel inspires you to say the rosary. Say you're, you're sitting around watching television or something, you get this thought, well, I, I should say the rosary. Uh, do it. Do it. Don't, don't think that was just your vagrant thought. That may have been a message from God coming through your guardian angel. So don't ignore the directives of God. By all means, pray the rosary or whatever else. Oh, I should go to Mass today. Well, I need to get up early this morning and, and get to Mass or, well, I think I need to make the Stations of the Cross this Friday. Or the, just pray the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. Whatever it is. I should go over to the hospital and visit this sick relative. You know, go over to the soup kitchen and work for an hour and feed the poor people. Um, those inspirations are coming from God through our good angel. Accept them. Do it. And then you'll be given yet another grace and another grace. And before you know it, you'll be growing. In holiness, very, very important. 
Now, another thing St. Teresa said is it's, it's entirely possible to backslide, to regress. You can be doing well. You can make great advances in the spiritual life. And then, you, you know, you, for whatever reason, you slack off. You stop praying the rosary. You stop going to daily mass. And then you begin to, you know, the spiritual life is not a plane. There are no planes in the spiritual life. Uh, the spiritual life is a steep mountain. You're either laboring and climbing up it, or you're sliding back down. Uh, there are no flat places in the spiritual life. And so you've got to work at it, uh, realizing that you, you're either making progress or you're going backwards because you're not standing still because there's no such thing. There is a correlation between virtue and advancement in prayer. Imagine that. You have to be a virtuous person if you want to be a spiritual person. You have to be patient and kind. You have to love the church. You have to make an effort uh, to learn your faith. Uh, all these things, all the virtues, uh, as you progress in virtue, that opens you for reception of grace so that you can progress in the spiritual life. St. Teresa was very, very clear on that. And then some of the, the, the most very, very important things that St. That uh, Teresa set forth, um, number one, humility. Uh, humility comes first. It's the most important thing. Uh, she counseled her nuns frequently. Now, now, uh, now daughters, don't, don't try to go running off to all the other mansions in the house, all the other rooms in the mansion. Rather, go to that room where holy humility is to be found and stay there because that's where your perfection uh, will be achieved. Humility. Humility is the acknowledgement of truth. I acknowledge who God is. He's everything. I acknowledge who I am. I'm nothing. Speck of dust. But, but, God loves the speck. That's the truth. That's humility. I can do nothing without God. You are the vine. I am the vine. You are the branches, Jesus said. Man, we're the branches. He's the vine. Without me, you can do nothing. So we have to, we have to stay in touch with Jesus. Uh, live in, in union. As you become more conformed to Jesus Christ, you will then be drawn into the life of the Trinity. That's the meaning of human existence. Okay? Detachment. You have to be detached from created things. If you're so attached to created things, uh, whether it's, it's your money or whatever it is, that is a wall, an obstacle that separates you from entering into deep union with God. Now, you have to have some basic things. You've got to have some money, I understand. You have to have a place to live, food to eat, clothing. Absolutely, you do. And you have to be prudent about that. But don't let it take over. And that's what usually happens. It takes over, and we become so preoccupied with created things, you know, things. Uh, that Things means anything other than God. Uh, God is what's important. Put God first, and, uh, and he will take care of you. Things will, will fall into place. Solitude. St. Teresa was very clear. You can't advance in the spiritual life without solitude. And it doesn't just mean physical solitude, although you have to have a little bit of that, too. Everybody does. You must have an hour, I would say. Every one of you has to have an hour a day by yourself in silence where you can be alone with God. We have too much noise and activity today. Uh, many people, God's talking to them and they can't hear Him. Why? Too much noise. Be still and know that I am God. St. Teresa would tell you that. Solitude also means that you should not be distracted by everybody and everything everybody says. St. Teresa used to say, live, live in the monastery like you're the only one there. Don't worry about who, who says this about you. Don't worry about who doesn't like you, who's gossiping about you. So what? You know, you, you get anxious and upset about what other people say about you and you let yourself be torn in a thousand different directions, why give anybody that much power over you? Just let it roll off. I know it's hard sometimes, but you've got to do it. If you want to be a spiritual person, 
you must be just divorced from all that. Don't, listen, be right with God and be, be right with other people. But if the other people don't like you, don't accept you, they reject you, they hate you, don't let it get to you. That may even be necessary for your perfection. Finally, love and generosity. And uh, St. Teresa would say, love is the cross, and the cross is love. In the end, that's how you find out if it's authentic love. To the degree you are willing to sacrifice and suffer for someone, that's how much you love them. And, and, and no more. No more, no less. Love is the cross, and the cross is love. I know I hear a lot of talk about the spiritual life. Oh, people want to be holy. They, they want to be saintly, and that's good. God bless you if, if that's what, what you think. That, that's, that's, that you're right. You're right. That, that's your purpose in life. Uh, however, very often what separates the men from the boys uh, is the willingness to accept the cross, willingness to accept the trials and tribulations that our state in life bring to us. It's not easy being a mom, not easy being a dad, not easy being a husband, a wife, not easy being a priest or religious. Uh, everything is difficult in its own way. Uh, to the degree we are generous in our sacrifice and willingness to embrace the cross, to that degree we will advance in holiness. And I'll go beyond that. To that degree we will be, our place in heaven will be established. The degree of self-sacrificing love you achieve on earth will determine the degree of glory you will have in heaven for all eternity. And those are the things that my good friend St. Teresa of Jesus or Teresa of Avila would teach us. That's only a, just a little glimpse. I encourage you to read um, books about her, read her life story. She's a wonderful saint and a wonderful teacher of the spiritual life. God love you, God bless you, and goodbye. Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Karapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. This week I have uh, lessons from my favorite saints. You might remember that we're accumulating uh, a series uh, which we're going to call Lessons from My Favorite Saints. And this week we're going to talk about St. Jean Vianney, the patron saint of parish priests. Uh, he's one of my very favorite saints and he certainly is one of the great saints in the history of the church. Um, St. John Vianney was born in um, 1786, May 8, 1786, uh, in um, France. Uh, his family were farmers. He grew up on a farm doing uh, farm labor. Uh, there are a lot of lessons that we can uh, learn from all the lives of the saints, but uh, St. Jean Vianney is uh, especially rich and I think especially uh, relevant for the times in which we live. Uh, as I mentioned, he is the patron saint of parish priests. And, uh, of course, there's a very good reason that the church names him the patron saint of parish priests. Um, he was indeed a, a parish priest and uh, he was exemplary in that fashion. But let's begin at the beginning. Uh, one of the first things uh, that, I, that I note in a lesson that I learned from this saint is uh, his family. St. John, like many of the, many of the saints, uh, was very blessed to be born into a very good Catholic family. His mother and father were very pious. Uh, they were uh, excellent traditional Catholics. Um, and you can't overemphasize that. You know, the value of a good Catholic family is um, it, it's just hard to imagine. Uh, we recall uh, the great St. Therese of Lisieux, 33rd doctor of the church. Um, no doubt both her parents uh, are going to be canonized, and uh, I, sometimes I can't keep up with these things. They may have already been. I know that the father, I believe, is blessed, and he may have been canonized by now. They both will be, I'll guarantee you that. Uh, the whole family, she had several sisters 
who became religious sisters. Um, and so that, that environment is so important. Um, it's almost like we can use an analogy from the uh, natural order. Uh, if you're in a healthy environment, um, uh, physically speaking, meaning you have clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, uh, and so forth, your chances of um, being healthy are a lot better. That's true morally and spiritually as well. I, I always think of um, <laughs> the words of one of my wise uh, Wyoming rancher friends uh, who expre expresses the converse of that. Um, he says, well, if you um, soak in a tub of manure long enough, you'll come out smelling funny. And, of course, he's, he's talking about uh, the moral uh, wasteland that we sometimes find ourselves in today. In today. Um, and, you know, kids can grow up in this. Young people are impressionable. Um, and uh, we, we have to be careful with this. And so the environment of a good Catholic family uh, cannot be overestimated. And St. John Vianney certainly profited from that from uh, the earliest uh, of his years. Another lesson that I learned from this saint, and I could say from every saint, but we see it uh, in St. John in, in so many ways, is um, from a very early age, he had to uh, learn to deal with uh, adversity, difficult times. Um, as I said, he grew up on a farm, and uh, you know I'm old enough to remember when, when I was growing up, many, if not most of my classmates were farm kids. And I can tell you, it was a, it's just a, I didn't grow up on a farm, but uh, I can tell you it's a great way uh, for kids to grow up uh, for a lot of reasons. It's wholesome, it's healthy. Uh, they learn about reality from a very early age. They learn about life and death. They, they learn about responsibility. They learn about hard work. I did some hard work on farms when I was young during the summer. Um, anyone who has ever... Uh, baled hay and gotten it up into a hayloft uh, will tell you that uh, that that's <laughs> that's really uh, hard uh, dry hot work and um, you know farm kids learn about those things and it builds it builds not just muscles it builds character uh, as well and St. John uh, certainly had that uh, he also had to learn to deal with adversity uh, in that uh, you know, when he was very young, the effects of the French Revolution uh, were still in evidence. Um, you couldn't practice your faith openly uh, for some years in France because of the uh, French Revolution. Uh, St. Jean Vianney remembers uh, uh, in, in his early years um, uh, assisting at Mass when it was illegal. Uh, you could have been killed. Uh, the, pr the priests risked their life to celebrate Mass. They had to uh, uh, celebrate Mass clandestinely in, uh, in people's homes, uh, in, the far, in the farm homes. Uh, St. John and his family would attend Mass um, in, with great secrecy. He was prepared for, his, for, the, for the sacraments um, by some religious sisters, also secretly. His first Holy Communion uh, uh, was um, in secret in the house with the windows draped so no one from the outside could, uh, could see in. Uh, so from his earliest years, he had to deal with uh, adversity uh, from a child. Uh, priests appeared as heroes to him. Why? They risked their lives to make the sacraments available to the people. And so, in fact, they were heroes. Uh, every time they would celebrate Mass or hear a confession, they literally risked capital punishment. Um, you know, just an observation, we, talk, we call this lessons from my favorite saints. Something that I, I've noticed about many of the saints and their lives. Adversity. Adversity strengthens. You know, uh, one of the rightful criticisms of this society, I believe, is that in many respects we have it too easy. Uh, a lot of the nonsense that goes on 
in society, a lot of the inane commentary we hear is because people just have too much time on their hands. They're not gainfully employed. Their mind is idle, and uh, they, they just really don't have that much to do. They don't have to struggle enough. Um, I, I remember uh, in uh, my hometown, uh, and I'm sure in a lot of hometowns, um, we had a, a, a small but, but very vibrant Jewish community. Uh, almost all the Jewish people were very, very successful. Now, some people might say, you know, it's something to do with the, with the um, cultural dimensions of, of the Jewish people. I think a lot of it had to do with the persecution that they underwent from the Nazis. Uh, they, uh, they had to flee their homeland. They were deprived. Uh, uh, they, in many cases, knew hunger. They knew want of every kind. And then when they, when they got to the United States uh, and other countries, it was kind of a promised land for them. And um, strengthened by all those hardships, it was easy for them to work 12 hours a day, uh, six, seven days a week sometimes. Um, they were delighted to have the chance to do it. Uh, and I've seen this when I was uh, in California with the Vietnamese people. Uh, they suffered a great deal during the, the Vietnam War. Many of them uh, fled their homeland, fled the communists. And when they arrived in California and other places, they were, they were quite poor. Um, and uh, certainly they were um, strangers, immigrants, um, of course, we help them, uh, as, such as this country uh, often does, but uh, they worked hard, and they didn't mind. You know, they did not mind working hard, and very quickly, uh, they, uh, like the Jewish people and the Irish people and the Italian people and the Polish people and so many others that knew the privation uh, of having to flee their homeland or persecution, um, uh, they were inured to, the, to that hardship. They were tough. They were able to work hard and accomplish a lot. Um, that's what, if I can use the term winners, that's what winners do. Losers make excuses. They always have an excuse. Oh, poor me. I'm this and I'm that. I'm persecuted and I'm downtrodden. Man, get up off your butt and you'll accomplish something. Uh, you know, you can play the victim or you can win the game. And uh, St. John Vianney understood from an early age uh, what suffering and privation were. He risked his life just to go to Mass in his early years. And so priests were heroes for him. Um, he did finally, um, he was able to undertake studies for the priesthood. That was another trial that he ran into. A lot of his classmates um, uh, that studied, studied under uh, 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 Monsieur Ballet, the, uh, a, a priest of uh, his area, um, they found their studies quite easily. He, he, he thought a lot of the boys uh, seemed to have a knack for academics. Uh, poor Jean did not. Uh, he had to struggle. He, he uh, had to struggle through. It didn't come easy to him. Uh, he had to kind of grind it out. And um, that's, a, that's a cross, too. Uh, that can be a very heavy cross for someone who wants so much to succeed and where academics are an integral and essential part of what you're doing. And certainly in the priesthood, uh, they are. Um, he longed to be a priest so much, but he had such a tough time. It was not doubt for quite a while that he'd be able to accomplish the studies and pass his exams. Uh, he, had, he especially had trouble with Latin. You know, in those days... Um, uh, and I'm still today, many of our older priests um, uh, studied in Latin. All of their courses in the seminary were given in Latin. Uh, now, we don't do that anymore, but uh, I can tell you this. Uh, if I had, had to take all my classes back uh, when I went through the seminary in Latin, uh, <laughs> I'd be like St. Jean Vianney. They'd, have, they'd have probably thought I had a, a mental defect as well, you know, intellectually challenged. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, you know, a, a person can be brilliant, but not have a knack um, for language. There's a, there's a, you know, I'm not an expert on the human brain, 
but I, I, I know that, the, you know, one side of it is more mathematics and science oriented and the other side more verbally oriented. And some people are strong in one and not so strong in the other. Uh, some people are strong in both, but uh, usually uh, a person has uh, one or the other. Uh, for the priesthood, I think um, the verbal part might be more imp important. St. John Van Ay might not have had that kind of aptitude, so he labored, he struggled, uh, but he persevered. And um, he demonstrated um, in his own time, and I think it's a lesson we would well keep in mind today, too, the most important attribute for a priest, yes, he has to have some uh, intellectual aptitude. He's got to have some aptitude, certainly, for philosophy and theology. That's a, that's a certain way of thinking, uh, certain cognitive processes involved in that. He's got to have some gift for that. But the most important thing is holiness of life. And that's what St. John Vianney demonstrated then and now. The most important attribute for a priest uh, is holiness of life. Sometimes, I, I believe, uh, in some places, um, we might forget that. Uh, I can recall cases from, oh, my own memory uh, when I was uh, going through formation, seminary, and so forth, where individuals who wanted to be priests so badly um, weren't allowed to be. I remember several cases, uh, oh, half a dozen, of men who were considered too old. Uh, well, he's too old. The bishop won't ordain him because, well, I'm not going to get much out of him. By the time we get him ordained, he'll, you know, he'll be in a nursing home. And, uh, you know, well, that's one attitude. Another attitude is, um, uh, like my own superiors, who have the attitude, look, if we get the man to the point where he was ordained a priest, praise the Lord. If he celebrates one mass and drops dead, it's more than worth it. More than worth it. Um, we've literally ordained men on their deathbed. Uh, I know men who celebrated one Mass, and they had to be propped up by two men to hold them at the altar. They were so weak, almost ready to die. They celebrated Mass. Infinite graces are brought down on that. So, you know, uh, the, the guy might not be perfectly intellectually capable, as long as he's, he's somewhat uh, intellectually capable, long he can learn the faith. If he can learn the catechism, as far as I'm concerned, that's enough. Anyone who knows the catechism of the Catholic Church today, up one side and down the other, as far as I'm concerned, I can make a priest out of him. And, uh, and I, I think the bishops ought to do the same. Um, same thing with, with age. Um, I know a man who was ordained when he was 84 years old. 84 years old! And I want to tell you something. He, he was in my, uh, when I was in the seminary, he was there. And we lived in, a, our seminary was in kind of hilly terrain. And going down to one of the rooms where we had classes from the dorms where we lived, it was a, kind of a steep climb. The dorm was up on the hill. And this uh, poor fella, he had to climb up and down that hill every day of his life for several years. And it wasn't easy. Uh, he was a little overweight, and he was just, well, 80 years old. You know what? He did it. Um, his bishop, to his credit, he ordained him, number one. Number two, he put him in his chaplain of a nursing home. <laughs> he never missed a day at work, and uh, you know, he's approaching 100 years old. He's never missed a day at work. And uh, he celebrates Mass every day, hears confession. It's a large nursing home. He's busy. Um, that's a good example. That's something that I think the life of St. Jean Vianney uh, teaches us. Um, well, he finally was able to get ordained and uh, with a lot of help from his teacher and mentor, uh, Father Valet, who was a great, I think, a, a, certainly a saintly man in his own right. Um, he had risked his life uh, to celebrate the sacraments during the Revolution. Um, he was a man of great, um, uh, great virtue, a man of great prayer and penance. And I think it can be said St. John Vianney learned a lot from his mentor, Monsieur Ballet. When he was on his deathbed, he, he called his young protege to him, and, he's, and he instructed him to hide his instruments of penance. He says, Jean, quick, 
hide my instruments of penance. He had a hair shirt and, uh, and a discipline uh, that they used in those days uh, um, uh, to do uh, rigorous penance. He said, quick, hide these, in bury these instruments of penance out in the forest. Because if I die and they find them, they'll think I'm a saint and leave me in purgatory forever. And so that was his mentor, uh, Monsieur Ballet. Um, so finally, John, St. John was ordained a priest. And uh, pretty quickly, uh, the bishop assigned him uh, to what might be considered the worst parish. You know, a lot of times um, young priests, uh, relatively newly ordained priests, are faced with very similar things today. You know, we have a lot of um, religious indifference. Uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, I'll tell you something, in North America, uh, it's more likely that a Catholic doesn't go to Mass than does. Uh, some estimates have Mass attendance as low as 20% in some dioceses. So 80% aren't going to Mass. Now, I'd call that religious indifferentism. Uh, and religious ignorance, the average Catholic knows nothing about their faith. Don't believe it? Uh, I'll come and give an exam in your area, and we'll see who passes. I'll guarantee you the vast majority will fail an exam I give to little kids for First Holy Communion. Don't believe it? What are the Ten Commandments? Hmm? What are the Ten Commandments? You, listen, if you're watching this, you're probably pretty good Catholics. You're actively engaged. So without looking, when this is over... Write down the Ten Commandments. And yes, yes, Marge, you have to get them in order. That's right, Joe. you got to get them one through ten. So we'll call that a, 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 a ten-part quiz. And enlist the Ten Commandments in order. See how many you get. That'll be a very instructive exercise. And if, and if you didn't do very well on it, I assure you that the other guys, they did much worse, or would do, if they should uh, take such a test. St. John had, uh, had to face this. How, how's he going to convert his parish? Uh, you know, a pre this, uh, the, the, the title they gave to priests in France in those days, and he's called that today the Corre d'Ars. Corre is a doctor, one who cures. A, 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 one, a doctor of souls is what it really means. Um, you know, the, the doctor of souls of ours. That, that's St. John Vianney. But look, you've got all these sick souls. They don't care about God. They're totally oblivious to reality. And uh, what's reality? Reality is this. Heaven, hell. Win, lose. Period, exclamation point. That's reality. And today, most people are not in touch with reality, which, by the way, is a good working definition of insanity. And now you know why our culture is largely insane, because most people aren't in touch with reality. What's reality? Absolute reality is God himself. I am who I am. Reality. All of the things as they relate to God. Uh, the only reality you and I are going to really care about when we come to the end of our life is uh, what the final and eternal destination is, heaven or hell. St. John had to get that across to his parishioners. How did he do it? Oh, he talked. Uh, he, he used to write out, laboriously, write out his sermons. And he was a, a, extremely um, uh, conscientious in that respect. But he, he apparently didn't have any gift for it at first. And so it was just hard labor for him. But he took it seriously. He prayed. He did rigorous penance. Finally, he realized what he had to do. He realized that his, that his, his parishioners, and uh, if any priests or others are listening who have anything to do with a, with a parish, listen to this real carefully. St. John realized that his parishioners would not do penance for themselves. He realized they would not pray themselves. Therefore, he had to do it for them. And so he began his lifelong work of prayer and penance. And I think, as much as anything, this is an identifying note of the life and priesthood of St. Jean Vianney. And, and it ought to be the life and note of any priest, any parish priest. Um, you want to convert your, par your parish, and, and you have to. Uh, St. Jean 
was, was, was deathly afraid of being a pastor of souls. You know, he rejoiced um, uh, he, to be your brother. I, I rejoice to be your brother in Christ. I'm scared to death to be your father in Christ. He was scared of that awesome ministry of pastor or cure, uh, cure or doctor of souls. He was scared of that. Why? Because he knew he had responsibility for the souls that were entrusted to him. It's a, it's a great blessing to be a pastor of souls. Commensurate responsibility. Um, we answer for everyone that's won or lost. Every soul that we help get to heaven, every soul that we lose in hell, the priest will answer. And he will answer dearly. And St. Jean Vianney, like all the saints, he had a clear perception of reality. He knew what he was faced with. And he took it very seriously. His, he knew that his own soul was at stake. Uh, and so he, he set out with um, great zeal to save souls. How did he do it? Well, he fasted rigorously. He, he ate almost nothing. Um, now, you know, we're not <laughs> recommending that, that you do that. Uh, but, but penance is necessary. You have to uh, do penance if you're going to be a serious person, spiritually speaking. Uh, no pain, no gain. No penance, no spiritual gain. Penance adds power to prayer, whether it's through fasting. Uh, you know, some people have built-in penance. And then it becomes a question of the, the will. What do you do with it? Some people suffer from um, very painful illnesses, uh, maybe a rheumatoid arthritis or regular uh, osteoarthritis. Um, you know, that can be a, a distressing thing as we get older. Um, but it can also be uh, a, a great gift, potential, built-in penance. What do you do? Like my grandmother said, offer it up. Offer it up. Don't lose it. Don't squander it. Don't waste it. We have all kinds of emotional uh, stresses, um, anxieties of every type, you know, especially today in this world with this economy and terrorism and so many things. It's a stressful world to live in. Offer it up. What does that mean? It means to unite your difficulties with Jesus on the cross. That's all. It, that's what it means. Um, willfully accept the trials and tribulations that your state and life bring. Offer it up. There's power in that. St. John, uh, he fasted rigorously. He, he would get up very early in the morning and kneel before the tabernacle, um, uh, praying there for hour after hour. Uh, if you haven't done it, uh, I, I recommend you do it at least, at least once to see what it is. Uh, you know, you get up 4 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, and then kneel, if not before the tabernacle, before a crucifix, and you try praying uh, three or four hours or more like he did. How about half hour? Um, all this, he afflicted himself. When united with Jesus, alone it's useless. But remember, we're not alone. We're in Christ through our baptism. And so, one with Jesus, that becomes powerful. And so, the, all that prayer and all that penance was bringing down graces to soften the hearts and open the minds of his parishioners. He was saving souls. And then, of course, his, his great um, work in the confessional. He was a martyr of the confessional. In the summer, he baked in that confessional, I assure you. Um, hour after hour, 8, 10, 12, 16 hours a day in the confessional, hearing confession. Let me tell you something. I've done it I, one time, one time for five days in San Antonio, Texas. I heard confessions, the least number of hours, eight hours, and the most 18 in a single 24-hour period for five days. Now, that's only five days. St. Jean Vianney did it decade after decade. And, I, and there was no air conditioning, and it was 100 degrees. And I was in an upstairs room, 
and there were people lined up down the block. They came in, and I thought it would never end. One after the other after the other. It was one of the greatest periods of time in my life. Uh, I had a dim intimation of what saints like St. John Vianney or Padre Pio, they were martyrs of the confessional. I assure you, it was like being in an oven in the summer in that confessional. Uh, in the winter, he froze. He was there. There was no heat. He was in there hearing confessions, 8, 10 hours, 12 hours, 14 hours a day, and more. And how many, t how many times, imagine it, he raised his hand in absolution. Tremendous, tremendous saint of the confessional. Um, eventually, a, um, an encyclical, the Pope, in 1959, Pope John XXIII wrote an encyclical, Sacerdoci Nostri uh, Primordia. Uh, that's an encyclical on St. John Vianney. And uh, Pope John XXIII uh, praised this great saint for the many beautiful things. Uh, his, his, the voluntary penances that he did to afflict uh, his body, he abstained almost completely from food and sleep. Why? To bring down grace on those he served. They wouldn't do it for themselves. They were like men in quicksand, up to their necks in quicksand. They would not do penance for their sins. They would not pray for the grace of God. Therefore, he knew he had to do it, and it cost him. Big time. And that's what saints do. Uh, his life of poverty, he had nothing. Uh, he said that uh, uh, the secret of my life, he said, the secret of my, my life uh, as a priest is that I have nothing. I gave everything away. And that's the way he lived. In great ev evangelical poverty. And the encyclical praised that. And, and, uh, and, and celibacy, chastity, perfect chastity in, in uh, consecrated celibacy. Uh, St. John said, a soul adorned with the virtue of chastity cannot help loving others, for it has discovered the source and font of all love, who is God himself. And then his life of obedience. He burned himself up like a piece of straw, the Holy Father said. He, he was consumed uh, as a holocaust offered for the salvation of souls, and, and of course his administration of the sacrament uh, of penance. And so, you see, St. Jean Vianney uh, is a great, great uh, saint, a great, uh, the great patron of parish priests. Uh, unfortunately, in his home country of France uh, some years ago, a number of the uh, uh, French priests uh, issued a statement saying that they didn't want him to be their patron saint. They renounced him. Uh, and why would they do that? Well, they did that because uh, his life was totally foreign to them. Uh, they were not persons of prayer, they were not persons of penance, and they had no regard for the salvation of souls. Some of them had probably lost the faith totally, and they must have because they couldn't have made a statement like that. But hopefully uh, things are getting better. St. John's praying for them and for us. And uh, we do well to learn uh, this lesson, these lessons from one of my favorite saints, uh, St. Saint John Vanney. Pray for us now and at the hour of our death. God bless you, God love you, and goodbye. Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Karapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. This week we're going to give you uh, another uh, glimpse of one of the episodes from a major series we're doing. Uh, it's called Lessons from My Favorite Saints. And we know one of the major feast days in the Universal Church is that of the birth of St. John the Baptist. That's celebrated on June 24th. Of course, John the Baptist is one of the greatest figures in all of Scripture, a, a tremendous figure in the church. Jesus himself said, uh, no man born of woman was ever greater than John the Baptist. Uh, that's a pretty strong endorsement from the Lord himself. And so we're going to speak to you. I'm just going to give you uh, some glimpses, uh, some of my perspective uh, on John the Baptist, some of the things that we can learn. We should learn 
from everything the church uh, presents to us, uh, including and very especially uh, from the lives of the saints. It doesn't mean we have to do everything literally that every saint did. We couldn't. We'd, uh, <laughs> we wouldn't make it if we tried that. But uh, certainly we, sh- we have to learn principles uh, and ideals, uh, ways of conducti- our, d- conducting ourselves that the saints um, uh, taught us. Let me begin by reading to you from the third chapter of the Gospel <clears throat> of Matthew. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather girdle around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit that befits repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these very stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's John the Baptist. Very, very powerful figure. We'll say a few words uh, about this great saint. Uh, He was, uh, in a sense, a cousin, actually, of Jesus. Um, We know that uh, when the Blessed Mother was with child, uh, Scripture tells us that she went in haste to the hill country of Judea to her cousin Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was also with with child, and she was of a very advanced age, uh, really beyond childbearing, but she had conceived, and um, uh, St. John the Baptist, of course, was her child, and uh, I, she was about six months with child at the time. And you remember what happened when uh, the Blessed Mother uh, entered uh, Zechariah's house, <clears throat> and, and Elizabeth greeted her. And she uh, basically rejoiced. And not only did Elizabeth rejoice, so too did the child in her womb. Now l- listen to these words. They're very, very important. Every word of Scripture is important. And listen to what the, uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, the first chapter, verse 39 and following says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country of Judea. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. Take careful note what it was that leaped in her womb. The Word of God said the baby leaped in her womb. It doesn't say abstract fetal tissue leaped in her womb. It doesn't say something else leaped in her womb. The baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. The baby, St. John the Baptist, in some mystical way, recognized the approach of the Messiah. And so Jesus in his mother's womb, John the Baptist in his mother's womb, met for the first time, you could say. And through the grace of God, uh, 
the great prophet and precursor of the Lord, he leaped for joy at the approach of the Messiah. And don't ever forget that it was a baby that leaped for joy in the womb of his mother. St. John grew up in, in grace. He was um, a hermit, basically. He, he lived, uh, he went out in the desert, as was some of the, there was a, a tradition of that, even that early on. Uh, he went out and lived a life of prayer and penance, uh, no doubt praying for the coming of the Messiah. Uh, he was, um, uh, basically we can glean from the words of Scripture, lived a very penitential life, you know, his his garment that he wore was camel hair. Now, I imagine you've never worn a, a garment of camel hair. I never have either. But I'll tell you this, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's real scratchy. Uh, and that was a way that uh, the early saints did penance. Now, that may seem, seem strange to you and I, but uh, they denied themselves uh, certain basic, licit comforts in order to do penance, which, which gave power to their prayer. Uh, if, if you doubt this, uh, you know, at another time I could give you about six university-level courses on the subject of penance that could help to uh, uh, ease your doubts. But suffice it to say <laughs> that the, the greatest man ever born of woman, according to Jesus, he went out into the desert alone in solitude to pray and to do penance. Out there in the desert, what, what, what did he find out there in the desert? Blistering heat, freezing cold, venomous serpents, and no doubt, the devil. That's what, that's what you find out in the desert, in that solitude. Remember, Jesus was driven by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days, uh, and he also encountered uh, the devil, Satan, uh, who tried to tempt him to no avail, of course. Uh, but St. John lived that uh, holy life of an anchorite or hermit out in the desert. What lesson is, is there in that for us? Well, uh, you don't have to go out into the, the desert or, 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 or uh, some wasteland or the mountains necessarily to pray, but I'll tell you what you do have to do. You've got to pray and you've got to do some penance. You must seek silence. I'm going to tell you one of the worst evils of the time. Noise, absolute, incessant, distracting noise. Be still, be still, and know that I am God. Remember the great prophet Elijah, uh, when he was uh, fleeing the political ruler of the time who wanted to, to kill him, Jezebel and King Ahab, he went up into the mountain fastness. And remember, he, he was searching for God. He was praying. And how did God come, come to him? Not in a big, noisy ruckus. Not in, in the crashing of rocks and the storm. In a still, tiny voice, God spoke to him. And I, I submit to you that if you don't have some silence, you're going to have a hard time hearing God when he speaks. One of the great, great, difficulties of our time, and it isn't spoken about much, <clears throat> and it's hugely important. Most people have no silence, no stillness, no solitude in their life. Uh, you've got to do it. You've got to do what, be, be creative, find some silence, do it early in the morning. If you've got to get up three, four o'clock in the morning to have some silence, to be alone with God and pray, then by all means do it. Because I'll tell you, in the still silence, you'll hear God. Much more than you will amidst the noise of a noisy world. Um, I assure you that the 60 million plus Catholics, nominal Catholics, in the United States, if they had regular silence to pray regularly, they would not be able to imagine that abortion is a non-issue. They would never, never vote for a political candidate 
who endorses, promotes, votes for abortion. Even partial birth abortion, indeed infanticide, as some have. Oh no. If they prayed and they had that silence to hear God speak to them, they'd recognize that horrible crime against humanity for what it is. So John spent the early years of his life, his formation, you could say, his religious formation, in the solitude of the desert, doing penance, praying, seeking the voice of God in stillness and solitude. And then, at the appointed time, his public ministry uh, began. Um, St. John uh, was a hermit who became a preacher. There are uh, quite a few preachers in the history of the church uh, who sought solitude first. They, they were hermits first. Um, St. Anthony of Padua spent time in a, a hermitage or retiro um, in the mountains of, uh, of Italy. Uh, there were others, um, uh, even those who became uh, bishops. They, they were first uh, hermits, great doctors uh, of the church, uh, some of them. Uh, uh, they started in silence, you know, a life of, uh, of a hermit. Uh, why? <laughs> I'll tell you something that I know for a fact, absolutely. Unless you spend a large amount of time in prayer and silence, you won't have anything much to say as a preacher. Unless you spend a lot of time in silence, in prayer and penance, listening for the voice of God, uh, when you open your mouth, not much worth anything is going to come out. You have to have that preparation. Now, I could say that for any minute. Now, you're all not called to be preachers, but a lot of you are called to be moms or dads. And sometimes you're at a loss for words on how to take care of your children, what to tell them. You have relatives, friends who, who just don't seem to get it. They don't care about God. You say, oh, what could I say? Being precedes doing. Seek the solitude, as John the Baptist did. You must spend time alone with God every day. I don't care if you're a busy mom or dad with ten kids. You've got to take time at some point. I don't get up 3 o'clock in the morning if you have to. But you must have prayer with an amount of silence involved. And then God will speak to you. And then you will be given the words to speak. And they'll be the right words. But, uh, you know, don't, don't, you know, people come to me all the time or ask me questions. Well, what can I say? What can I do? My brother won't do this. My mother won't do this. My, my daughter won't do that. They don't go to church. Pray more, talk less. Silence. In the silence, God will speak to you. You can't give what you don't have. So first you have to receive that grace, then you can give it. That's what St. John the Baptist did. We remember that Jesus, the Lord himself, went out and requested baptism from John. Now John, prophet that he was, recognized uh, Jesus, and, and he knew he's not, he's not fit to untie his, his sandal. Or he's not fit to touch him. He, he recognized the, the infinite holiness of Jesus, but Jesus told him it's necessary. Go ahead and do this. And so Jesus went down into the waters of baptism and baptized them. The waters of baptism were made holy when the Holy One went into them. And so John uh, gave him that, that baptism of, of repentance. Jesus didn't need to repent. He had no sin. But what he was doing, he was, he was showing the way, and he was doing something very, very significant. He was baptizing the waters of baptism. But John pointed out that, uh, that, that he was given a baptism of repentance. Now, John did what every prophet did and what Jesus himself would do. He preached repentance. Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There is no other essential message of any prophet, of any priest. Jesus himself began his public ministry 
by telling people to reform their lives, change, metanoia, change, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the way it was then, and that's the way it is now. As a preacher and a priest, if I were to preach an essential message other than that, I'd be barking up the wrong tree. Repent. Change. Sometimes people are too arrogant to accept that. They don't have enough humility. You know, you go in your average parish today, much less the world at large, (laughs) and you preach a strong message of repentance, some people would be offended. Well, that's because they are offended by the truth. But see, that's what John did. That's what Jesus did. They preached the truth in love, but nonetheless, they preached it. They didn't water it down. They didn't distort it. They didn't candy coat it. They preached it full-throated and unsparingly. They performed the mission in season and out of season, convenient or inconvenient. And so this... This great and final witness of all the the prophets, John the Baptist, kind of a a bridge between the Old Testament and the New, Uh, he preached this message of repentance. Remember what he said to the uh, leaders of the time, even the religious leaders. Remember what he called the Pharisees and Sadducees when they came out into the desert? (laughs) Brood of vipers, brood of vipers, venomous serpents. Who warned you of the wrath to come? You know, what are you doing here? You know, Jesus would later see, what did you go out there in the desert to see, Jesus said to them. What did you go out to see a man dressed up in, in fine clothing? Uh, to see a political figure? <laughs> no, 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 none of that. John the Baptist, Saint Prophet. No greater man ever born of woman but John the Baptist. And, and no... What, what John the Baptist was, what, what was he? Well, he was a man of prayer and penance, that hermit, that's the way he started. And then he was a fearless preacher, and he didn't care. Religious leaders, political leaders, he told them the truth. He performed the mission. He was faithful to God. That's, that's, that's where in his greatness lies. And, and what, what lesson is, is there in the life of John the Baptist, from beginning to end. Well, as we said, you've got to begin with prayer. You've got to begin and end with prayer. And and not just any prayer. Some of your prayer has to be in silence. Now, you may be able to go to a, a church with the Blessed Sacrament, and hopefully that church is very quiet and still, and there in the presence, the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, you can make a holy hour. You can start your day or end your day that way. And that would be fantastic. But a lot of people can't do that. And so what do you do? You have to go to some quiet place. You you have to go into a corner of your home. I think every Catholic home, every Christian home should have, uh, you might not be able to dedicate a whole room to it, but a corner, a quiet corner of a quiet room where you have a crucifix, uh, maybe a, um, an image of Our Lady, uh, and you pray there in silence. And, and certain time must be set aside for that prayer in solitude. You might want to take a walk if, you, if you're lucky like me, and, it, and it's not luck. I moved to an area of the country where I have millions of acres of solitude. Um, I'm fortunate. I have some land, I, I, can, um, I can pray in my chapel, or I can go out in the, in the forest and pray in solitude that way. Uh, in any event, you've got to do it. You will not be able to meet the challenges of your state and life, of our religion, unless you do that. You've got to be strengthened by that contact with God. Um, that's how John began and then into his public ministry. He was fearless. He was fearless. And then you, you know how he ended, too, don't you? Um, he, got, he was thrown in jail because why? Well, he told the king, the highest political authority in the land, he told, told the king it's not right that he should be married to his brother's wife. 
That's what happened. Took his brother's wife and married. Did whatever he wanted to do. You know, no moral boundaries. Um, we've seen that through history, where kings, um, other leaders, even presidents, no moral boundaries. They're going to do what they're going to do, and who's going to tell them otherwise? Well, John the Baptist told them otherwise. He died for his good deed. You know, the, the wife of the king wanted his head on a platter, and she got it because the king had no guts. The king couldn't resist. He was afraid of public opinion. He was afraid of offending those at the party. And so the executioner beheaded St. John the Baptist. And, and that's a good thing to remember. Um, that kind of good deed frequently never goes unpunished. So John, one of the greatest, greatest saints in our history, that's what he teaches us. He teaches us about prayer and penance. He teaches us about courage, the courage of our convictions. You know, very frequently through history, political leaders have done things, uh, instituted laws, so-called, that were illegal. You know, because Hitler said a certain class of human beings uh, were substandard, and he didn't want them, and he exterminated them. Uh, that included the, the, uh, the chosen people, the Jewish people. That included Catholic priests and other classes of, of persons. Um, Hitler was the uh, secular authority at the time. And a lot of people, through fear or complacency, uh, whatever it was, they went along with the program. Uh, you know, at, at the uh, war tr crime trials in Nuremberg, remember they, uh, they had uh, some of the officers, the SS men and others, and they said, well, we're just following orders. We're just obeying what the Fuhrer said, you know, following the law. That's what they said at Nuremberg. And they hung them. They hung them for their crimes. And we said, never again. Today, the worst evil of our time is the genocide of abortion. And I assure you that if St. John the Baptist were alive and preaching in the wilderness of this society, he would attack it vigorously and fearlessly. And yet we go skipping and dancing on our merry way, in many cases not the least bit concerned about it. Catholics by the millions perpetuate this human disaster, this incredible crime against humanity. They even vote for politicians who have done everything to further the outrage of abortion on demand. Even partial birth abortion. Even infanticide. The voting record is there for all to see. And yet some Catholics and other Christians are so numb, so dead in their sins, they can't recognize the evil for what it is. In a sense, we have declared detente with evil. Have you noticed that in the political campaigns, oh, everybody knows one's for abortion and one is for life. Everybody knows that. But have you noticed there's never been any serious debate allowed on the question in the public eye. There's a kind of a, a laissez-faire policy uh, in, in effect. You'll, you don't even hear the, uh, the, the, the pro-life candidates engaging in serious discussion about that. I call that detente with evil. You know, oh, we don't want to, we don't want to ruffle any feathers, we don't, oh, that's a subject that people, that's a sore subject. Um, let me tell you something. God isn't blind, nor is he deaf. 
nor is he powerless. The voices of tens of millions of murdered children cry out from the dust. How long, O Lord? How long? St. John the Baptist was a bright light shining in the desert. He was the one in the wilderness crying out, Make straight the paths of the Lord. Let me tell you something. Jesus is not going to come on a trail of innocent blood. Do not think for a moment that this nation or the Western world in general will be blessed and or protected by the grace of God indefinitely so long as this holocaust of innocent blood is shed. Uh, Don't think for a moment we're going to escape unscathed. I've said this for years. It's come true. A proliferation, a succession of natural disasters. No security. Job security. Homeland security. No security. Living in fear of the next attack. Wars springing up over all the earth. And all of those leading to financial disaster. Financial ruin. One natural disaster after the next. One terrorist attack and or war after the next. One stupid economic decision after the next. The country is drained of resources and ultimately brought to her knees. Economically. There is one answer to this disaster. The only answer. The only answer there ever was. The only answer there is now. The only answer there will be in the future. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the message of all the prophets. That was a message of St. John the Baptist. That is the message of Jesus Christ. And the servant is no better and no different than his master. So that, too, must be our message. God love you. God bless you. And goodbye. Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Karapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. Today we're going to speak about the year of St. Paul. You know, the Holy Father last year in uh, 2007 announced that there would be a very special uh, year in the church uh, to uh, commemorate the uh, 2000th anniversary of the birth of St. Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles. Let me read to you from the... uh, the original letter that uh, the Holy Father um, prepared at Vatican City. Um, I got this from Zenit. If, if you don't know about Zenit, it's a good thing. Z-E-N-I-T. It's a new Catholic news service. Uh, you can subscribe to it uh, on the Internet. It's free. Uh, at least last time I checked, it was free. And uh, a lot of news about what's going on in the church. It's, it's a, a very good service. Uh, they said uh, that Benedict the 16th has declared June 2008 through June 2009 the year of St. Paul in celebration of the 2000th anniversary of the saint's birth. The Pope decreed the year in a Vesper celebration uh, held on June 28th, the year 2007, at St. Paul outside the walls, great basilica in Rome. The Holy Father explained during his homily, this Pauline year will take place in a special way in Rome, where for 2,000 years, under the papal altar of this basilica, lies the tomb that, according to experts and undisputed tradition, has conserved the remains of the apostle St. Paul. Uh, Just as a side note, 
Um, after I was ordained uh, at St. Peter's Basilica in 1991, I, I uh, celebrated my first Mass uh, in the uh, crypt of St. Peter's over the tomb of, of St. Peter in the Clementine Chapel. And then my second Mass was at um, uh, St. Mary Major. And then the third one was at St. John Lateran. And my fourth Mass was at St. Paul outside the walls. Those are the four great major basilicas uh, in Rome. Uh, the pontiff said in the papal basilica and Benedictine Abbey attached to it, there can take place a series of liturgical, cultural, and ecumenical events, as well as various pastoral and social initiatives, all of them inspired by Pauline spirituality. Special attention can also be given to pilgrims who from various places will want to go to the tomb of the apostle in a penitential way in order to find spiritual benefits. Uh, that would be a great pilgrimage to make, and I assure you it will be penitential considering the state of the airlines today. <laughs> so you could make a trip to Rome and uh, visit the tomb of St. Paul. You'll get many great blessings, and it'll be more than worth the aggravation you'll probably have to put up by uh, traveling by air. Um, no, it's probably not that bad. Maybe they'll figure something out uh, by that, the time you go. Meetings for study will be promoted and there will be special publications on Pauline text to promote the immense rit richness of the teaching contained in them, a true patrimony of humanity redeemed by Christ. Uh, also, in every part of the world, similar initiatives will be organized in dioceses, sanctuaries, and places of prayer by religious institutions, uh, institutes of study and assistance which carry the name of St. Paul or which have been inspired by him and his teaching. Uh, Benedict XVI explained that this year must have an, an important ecumenical dimension. Why do you suppose that is? Why do you suppose the Pope wants this year of St. Paul to have a, a particularly ecumenical dimension to it? Well, remember who St. Paul was, the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay? He went to those outside of the, uh, the Jewish faith, the chosen people. Uh, and he was concerned, that, and, and he knew that God's uh, salvation was offered to all people. And so uh, the um, uh, emphasis on ecumenism in this year of St. Paul is very important. Um, we, we should uh, hope for unity among all the Christian churches. So what we're going to do, uh, do our little part, uh, I'm going to... Uh, dedicate uh, a lot of our uh, teaching and preaching time to St. Paul. Uh, technically, this will begin June 29th this year, 2008, with the, um, uh, the great feast of uh, the Apostles St. Peter and Paul. And um, what we'll do is we'll be preparing a very special series, uh, a rather extensive series, throughout the course of the, uh, the year. Uh, I don't know exactly... Uh, how many um, presentations that will be in this, but quite a few. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the entire Pauline corpus from the New Testament. That's all the letters of St. Paul. And I'm going to even in include the letter to the Hebrews, which um, most, probably most contemporary scholars uh, would say St. Paul was probably not the author of the letter to the Hebrews, um, whenever we come to that, we, we say uh, a, a reading from the letter, uh, the, the letter to the Hebrews. Um, we don't say it's St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, but many of the saints, fathers and doctors of the church um, throughout the ages, um, believe St. Paul uh, was the author. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not convinced either way. But I'm just going to, as an arbitrary subjective thing, I'm including it. And that'll be 99 chapters in total, 99 chapters of um, the writings of St. Paul. And what I'm going to do in that is I'm going to preach. Uh, that's what I do. Um, it, it wouldn't be well for me to, to try to do something other than what I'm called to do, and I'm, called, I'm basically a preacher. Uh, certainly there's teaching involved uh, in preaching. But by and large, I'm a preacher, so I'm going to preach on the letters of St. Paul from beginning to end, 
what I'll do is I'll synthesize uh, one letter at a time. Uh, we'll, we'll begin um, uh, right with the, the letter to the Romans, and we'll go through, and I will synthesize into X number of, of sermons uh, the letters of St. Paul. And um, we, we, it's such a rich thing. I could preach on the letters of St. Paul for the rest of my life and never exhaust that great richness. Um, I've preached probably uh, as much on the letters of St. Paul as, as on um, any of the, the uh, books of sacred scripture, with the exception of the Gospels, perhaps. Uh, and so what do we learn from St. Paul so much? You know, um, a great deal of our theology in the Catholic Church comes from uh, the, the various letters of St. Paul, especially in moral theology. Uh, he was a great moral theologian. He was, of course, an apostle, the apostle to the Gentile. His, he was a bishop, of course. Um, and uh, what he did was he performed the primary function of uh, a, a bishop. Uh, he confirmed the brethren. He preached. He taught. That's what he did. Uh, he wasn't a local priest. He wasn't a, what we would call a parish priest. Uh, he traveled. He went to the various churches, and he preached. He was a preacher. Um, the uh, mission preachers uh, that have uh, operated in the church ever since St. Paul uh, are in that tradition. Myself, that's what I've done mostly. Now, uh, we, I, I assure you, if St. Paul were alive and, and working in the church today, he'd have a website. There's no question about that. St. Paul would have a website. St. Paul, would, on, would, would he'd be on EWTN, for sure. St. Paul would be on the radio. St. Paul will be using every means available to spread the gospel. There's no question about it, and that's why we do it. Uh, it's so important. Um, you know, I started out doing the only thing I could do in the beginning, which was basically the, the same thing St. Paul did, physically traveling every place. Going to little parishes in the beginning, I remember um, uh, right when I finished my studies, I, I started to preach immediately, immediately. Uh, and I'd get on airplanes or, or, you know, automobiles, whatever it took to get to little parishes here and there, sometimes preaching to as few as a dozen people, 20 people. Um, and then over time, the, uh, the congregations, the audiences, became bigger and bigger, and uh, then we eventually did what we always knew we would do, what my superiors in the church um, said that I would do. We used the means of social communication, uh, as the church has mandated, uh, to preach the gospel. And so we began with television and radio, and then eventually uh, with the internet. And so St. Paul, the great apostle, to the Gentiles. Uh, he taught so many things. You know, some of the key things that he taught. Moral theology, we said that, you know, in the, uh, in, in the um, first of St. Paul's letters, listed chronologically, I mean, the first in the Bible, uh, Romans has 16 chapters. And um, it, it, it's, uh, it's pretty strong, um, as many of his letters are. Um, they're, 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 they, you know, he talked to the Romans and um, spoke about several things. Now, St. Paul was a straight shooter, as were all of the saints. Um, that something, I think, over the years has happened. Uh, I don't know if we, perhaps we think that um, somehow by toning things down, we have a better chance of succeeding. Uh, there's a certain truth in that. Uh, but only to a point. You don't want to tone it down uh, to, to where it becomes unrecognizable. Um, uh, St. Saint, Saint Paul didn't do that. Uh, in, in Romans, right off in chapter 1, he talked about the, not being ashamed of the gospel. Um, are we ashamed of the gospel? I sometimes wonder today, because we are pretty quiet in the face of gross moral evil. Uh, quite frequently, quite frequently. Now, you know, everyone in the church pretty much knows, well, I shouldn't say that. We used to know what the church held in various moral areas. The church still holds the same exact thing that she ever held in basic moral 
teaching. But a lot of people have become confused because of uh, maybe ambiguous teaching. The teaching itself isn't ambiguous. It's straightforward, black and white truth. Um, but St. Paul talked to the Romans. Uh, he said, you know, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Now, why would he say that? Well, because a lot of people were, were uh, ashamed of the gospel. They were afraid in a pagan atmosphere to give witness to the truth of the gospel. Um, my grandmother used to say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. All right? Uh, look at today. How many Catholics are ashamed of the gospel? You know, they, they're afraid. Uh, you don't have to preach sermons on street corners. You don't have to be loud about it. You don't have to be obnoxious about it. Quiet strength. Knowing that you're right. You know, in a neo-pagan society, don't be ashamed of the gospel. We're right. They're wrong. Very simple. Uh, he talked to the Roman. You said your, your senseless minds are darkened. You know, you don't know your left hand or your right. You're given up to lust. Um, he, he could be he, talking to this generation in particular. Um, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. He said to them, how often that's happened here. He spoke about homosexuality. Um, there are those today who would distort and pervert the word of God, trying to say that, that it's just fine. It's, it's okay, you know, if that's what you want to do, fine. It's just an alternative lifestyle. Once again, using verbal engineering to confuse people. The, 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 the word of God doesn't say it's fine. Uh, St. Paul's very, very clear that it is an evil thing. We're not saying people that have a certain orientation are evil, but acting out on that orientation is serious sin, mortal sin. St. Paul's clear on that. Um, he says that since they didn't see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and improper conduct. And they were filled with all kind of wickedness. This is how St. Paul talked. Can you imagine today if St. Paul, or in fact Jesus, went to many of our churches today? Um, I know this because I've preached in far more churches than the average priest. Uh, I've traveled two million miles preaching the gospel. I've preached in 49 states, multiple dioceses in, in, in some of those states, uh, several foreign countries. Um, and, and I've had, a, in, by and large, a much better than average response, but I've also gone to the places who invited me, and they knew what they were getting. If I were to go to your average parish, many places, uh, the, the re response would not be as good. A lot of places, they'd run you out of town on a rail. I used to, in the beginning, before my reputation preceded me, I used to tell uh, whoever was traveling with me, I said, Keep, keep the vehicle running. We might have to make a quick getaway. Because, you know, sometimes when you talk like St. Paul, uh, they, don't, they don't like it very much. Uh, St. Paul said to the Romans, you're filled with wickedness. You're evil. Filled with covetousness, malice. You're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity. You're gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, and boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient. To your parents, you're foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. <laughs> Those were just some of the, a few of the things St. Paul said. That's how he talked, straight forward. And I'll tell you something, nobody was ever confused about what he meant. He was a straight shooter. You know, uh, Jesus said, say yes when you mean no, yes, and no when you mean no. Yes, when you mean yes, and no, when you mean no, all else is from the evil one. In other words, what he was saying was just speak the truth clearly and unambiguously. <laughs> How often, I remember when I began uh, preaching, I, would, uh, I, I was a preacher from the first day of my, of my ministry, and I remember on... Uh, a few occasions when I was beginning, I, there would be a priest or a monsignor or even a bishop who, who would uh, try to restrain me and hold me back, rein me back. Say, now, don't talk about I remember one monsignor when I went to do a parish mission in Lent. He said, now, Father, please 
don't talk about sin. Don't talk about sin. During Lent, your people were immaculately conceived. You know, that, that, hey, a Lenten mission. I'm going to talk about sin. I'm going to talk about grace. You have to. How do you get around that? I remember a bishop one time said to me, now, now John, I want you to be smooth. This is an exact quote. <laughs> not exaggerating. And he wasn't a bad bishop. He was a good bishop. But he said to me, he, he meant well, but he, he said, now, John, I want you to be smooth. I want you to be nuanced in your presentation. I've come over the years to hate that word, nuance. If I ever run into a nuance, I'll strangle it. I, I, I want you to be nuanced in your presentation. I want you to be smooth, right? You know, say yes when you mean yes, and say no when you mean no, or else you run the risk of becoming confused and confusing others. Uh, you know, the truth is pure intelligibility. God, by definition, is pure intelligibility. But we like to complicate uh, a perfectly intelligible and simple thing. And then, it, you know, we, we like to nuance pure intelligibility. That's God and the things as they pertain to God. That's theology. The Defin definition of theology is the science of the study of God and all things else as they pertain to God. We like to take the pure intelligibility, which is truth, uh, God himself, take pure intelligibility and nuance it into utter ambiguity. And that is why people very frequently, even in the church, are confused about that things. Um, I've had people ask me, I had a woman uh, uh, ask me the other day after Mass, um, I... I very rare that I do it, but I, I was celebrating Mass at a parish, and after she, she came up to me, her dad had passed away, and, and she said, is there still purgatory? I've, all, I've been <laughs> asked that exact question um, many, many times, because uh, the people have, haven't been taught clearly, or they haven't been taught at all in many cases, and so it's like, I mean, did God abolish purgatory? Is there still purgatory? Duh. Yeah. Yeah. She was worried about that. She was afraid like it's a horrible thing. No, no. I told her it's the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God. But sometimes they'll take pure intelligibility and they'll nuance it into utter ambiguity. St. Paul did not do that. St. Paul was very clear in his teaching. You know, if you have ever listened to certain preachers or teachers of the faith and, uh, you know, they sound very erudite sometimes. They're very smooth, uh, very nuanced in their presentation. And I, I rem <laughs> it reminds me of um, sophistry. You know what a sophist is in uh, the history of Greek philosophy? Uh, the sophists were smooth talkers. The sophists um, would uh, hold forth. They, they talked for money. Uh, they'd, they'd talk uh, in very, very... Um, articulate, eloquent terms, and, uh, you know, after they g got done, the, the people listening, uh, you know, the uh, usually the educated, upper-class people, the sophisticated people would say, oh, uh, didn't, um, whatever his name was, Damocles, Sophocles, whoever it might be, oh, didn't he speak wonderfully, how beautiful, uh, and then some old farmer with common sense said, yeah, but what did he say? He didn't say anything. Sound familiar? Watch out. A lot of sophists. Oh, they're smooth. They're articulate. They're eloquent, but they don't say anything. Be careful. What is the substance? St. Paul had substance. St. Paul wasn't one of these. He didn't look impressive. You know, he wasn't a, a magnificent, no doubt, tall, handsome man that commanded the audience. No, we have evidence from from the writings that, no, he was small of stature, he wasn't so impressive, and he didn't engage in sophistry. You know, he, he, he didn't try to um, uh, t tell smooth uh, tales. He didn't, one thing he didn't do, he did not confirm people in their sins. You know, you can become very popular as a speaker, even in the church, by telling people what they want to hear. Uh, that's, that's terrible. You know, don't, you know, don't 
tell people what they want to hear. Tell them what they need to hear. In other words, tell them the truth. That's what St. Paul did. He told the truth. He preached the truth in love. Um, don't think for a moment it is pastoral, merciful, or charitable to confirm people in their sins. Oh, you're okay. I'm okay. Whatever you want to do is all right. God loves you just where you're at. <laughs> God does love you wherever you are. But he doesn't love your sins. Your sins are like cancer eating you alive. I'm not going to tell you it's all right. When it's not, St. Paul didn't say it was okay. He was clear and he was forceful. And where did the power of his preaching come from? Well, he wasn't ashamed of the gospel. We know that. Um, something else, though. The power of the cross. Our theology of the cross, uh, to a large extent, comes from St. Paul. His interpretation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of the events of the Paschal Mystery. Um, my doctoral thesis in dogmatic theology was on the subject of the meaning of Christian suffering. You know, uh, uh, the cross stands at the veritable uh, uh, apex of our faith. Um, it can be summed up, basically, no pain, no gain, no cross, no crown, no goal, no glory. Good Friday always precedes Easter Sunday. We get a lot of the, this is from St. Paul. Uh, a lot of our, um, what's called soteriology, um, that, that is the branch of, of theology that deals with uh, the Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, our, our Christology, much of it, comes from St. Paul. Um, remember, he, he said, is no longer... I who live, but Christ who lives within me. It is when I am weak that I am strong, St. Paul says. Uh, God's mighty power is brought to perfection in weakness. Uh, he, he understood this. This is where all the power for the church's work comes from. It's a paradox. Uh, the cross itself is a paradox to the... Um, unenlightened mind, the person without faith, the cross is a scandal, you know, it's a stumbling block, and it's absurdity to people who don't have faith. But for those who have faith, that's the power of God working for salvation. This, this is St. Paul's teaching. This is the crux of much of St. Paul's uh, teaching. You know, uh, this has practical significance. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, during the course of the, uh, the coming year uh, in this um, series on, on St. Paul, um, e every one of us in some way suffers this. Uh, you suffer from physical things. Um, you're getting older. I don't know anybody who isn't getting older. Uh, every one of us is getting older. Uh, if it hasn't caught up with you yet, eventually you'll begin to lose your strength, your agility, You'll have more aches and pains. Your eyesight won't be as sharp as it used to be. Your hearing won't be as good as it one day was. Uh, all these things, this is a kind of, uh, we're being consumed. Every moment, uh, we're being consumed. Now, the theology of St. Paul shows us that that's not a negative thing. That's a plus sign. The cross is not negative. The cross is a plus sign. Just look at it. Looks like a plus sign to me, physically. It's a plus sign. Now, that, that's easy to say, hard to interiorize, you know. You may be going through um, terrible physical sufferings. You might have uh, arthritis uh, of the worst kind or not so bad, but it's painful. You know, you could have a heart condition. You might have cancer, God forbid, or any number of a thousand other afflictions that, that beset uh, humanity. It's the teaching of St. Paul, primarily. The Word of God, as, as spoken and preached by St. Paul, recorded in those letters, um, that really gives us hope. You know, dying, Jesus destroyed our death. Rising, he restored our life. And so we live through him, with him, and in him. And so as you're getting older, you have more physical things wrong with you, you may have emotional Suffering, depression, anxiety. So many people suffer today. 
You know, they tell me that the main classification of pharmaceuticals today are, 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 are you know, antidepressants and things in those categories. Um, a lot of the people that are they're prescribed for, I'm not sure if that's the best answer for them or not. Some people undoubtedly probably need something. But uh, it, it is a commentary on the state of society, that, that that's the way we are. We have to be medicated so much. Well, if you, if you need to take medicine, take it. I'm not telling you not to. You should. But after you've done everything you can and you're still struggling, you're still suffering, like my grandma said, offer it up. Uh, you know, a great deal of St. Paul's teaching in theology can be summed up in that old axiom, which we don't hear much any, anymore. Uh, you hear it from me and maybe a couple other people in the church, but it used to be a common saying in Catholic households whenever you dealt with affliction or, or pain or suffering. Offer it up. And what that means is unite yourself with Jesus. You are united to him through your baptism and through receiving the Holy Eucharist. And so unite your suffering, your difficulties, your struggles, even things that are, that are, that are sinful. Well, how can you unite a sin with Jesus? Well, you, you, you don't, but the struggle. You, can, you may have a lifelong struggle with an affliction. Uh, it, it may be a disease. It may be like alcoholism, drug addiction. Uh, certainly that's not of God, but God sympathizes with your struggles. And your struggles are not in vain. Unite them to Jesus. How do you do that? An act of the will. An act of the will. The sisters, when I was growing up, the nuns, used to teach the kids for First Communion, now children, um, at Mass. Uh, when, the pri when the priest elevates the paten with the consecrated host and the chalice with the precious blood, and he says, through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor to you, Almighty Father, forever and ever. You put yourself with all your struggles, all your difficulties, all your defects, you, you put yourself through an act of the will on the paten and in the chalice and let the priest offer you up, offer you up to God our Father through, with, and in Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that's some of the substance, the essence, uh, synth synthesis of St. Paul's magnificent teaching. It's right at the heart of our faith. And so in the coming year, we'll talk a lot about St. Paul. We'll preach on, uh, on his letters. There are 99 chapters, if you, if you include uh, Hebrews. And we will um, we'll preach on those, all the substance of the letters of St. Paul. I think you'll get a lot out of it, so you look forward to that. Uh, that'll be coming. Well, God bless you. God love you, and goodbye. Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Karapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. This week I'm going to uh, speak to you about one of my favorite saints. This included in our uh, series, which will be entitled Lessons from My Favorite Saints. I'm going to speak about uh, Padre Pio, St. Pio of Pietrocina. Uh, many of you are uh, familiar with Padre Pio. Uh, certainly, uh, he was very well loved uh, long before he was canonized a saint. He is a saint of our times. You see on the, the desk here, I have a little picture of him. Uh, many of you uh, have sent me uh, mass cards and prayer intentions and, and letters uh, um, wishing me, uh, you know, a quick recovery from my illnesses, and uh, this one happens to be from uh, the uh, monastery where uh, Padre Pio was for his uh, entire life uh, as a Capuchin Franciscan. Uh, two passages of scripture that really sum up the life of, of uh, St. Pio, both from St. Paul. Far be it from me to glory in anything except in the cross of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, that's from Galatians 6.14. And then uh, my favorite one, which I, I think also uh, truly summarizes uh, the life and ministry of Padre Pio, St. Pio. Uh, it is now my joy to suffer for you. 
as I fill up in my own poor human flesh that which is yet to be fulfilled in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. And that's uh, a, a tremendous uh, passage from Colossians uh, one twenty four and following. I think that was, you could call that the central uh, gospel text, not gospel, but uh, New Testament text uh, in my doctoral thesis, which was on the meaning of human suffering in the teaching of Pope John Paul II. Let me read to you right from the, uh, the monastery that knew Padre Pio the best, the place where he lived. It says, St. Pio was born of simple, hard-working farming people on the 25th of May, 1887, in Pietrelcina, southern Italy. He was tutored privately until his entry into the Capuchin Friars at the age of 15. Uh, always of feeble health, but strong will, with the help of grace, he completed the required studies and was ordained a priest in 1910. On 20th of September, 1918, the five wounds of our Lord's Passion appeared on his body the stigmata, uh, making him the first stigmatized priest in the history of the church. Countless uh, numbers were attracted to his confessional, and many more received his saintly and spiritual guidance through correspondence. His whole life was marked by long hours of prayer and continuous austerity. His letters to his spiritual directors reveal the ineffable sufferings, physical and spiritual, which accompanied him through all of his life. They also reveal his very deep union with God, his burning love for the Blessed Eucharist and our Blessed Mother, and worn out by over a half a century of intense suffering in constant apostolic activity in San Giovanni Rotondo, he was called to his heavenly reward on the 23rd of September, 1968. Uh, he was um, canonized on the 16th of June, 2002, uh, and, um, by Pope John Paul II. So, Padre Pio, Saint Pio, uh, a magnificent saint, a man of our times, a saint of our times. Now, in the very brief time that I have, uh, I, I, I can't say a whole lot. I'm just going to try to give you a little... A little um, summary of Padre Pio, what he teaches us, the essence of his life. He probably, for me, was the single most important saint uh, in most of the years, especially the early years of my vocation. Uh, he was a great father uh, and protector of my vocation. He helped me a great deal. He inspired me a great deal. Uh, and so we'll, we'll try to talk about uh, the essence of Padre Pio and the lessons that we can learn from his life. Uh, he was a man of great prayer and suffering. Uh, although he really never left uh, the monastery, the friary where he was after he went in there, uh, he affected the whole world. Millions and millions of people uh, were touched by Padre Pio by his life, his holiness, his apostolic work. Uh, his entire life is wrapped up in his vocation, number one, as a Franciscan friar, a Capuchin friar, number two, as a, as a priest. And these are very much uh, interconnected. You know, throughout the years, I've, I've uh, witnessed some of the um, stuff written about St. Francis, um, and to be honest with you, a lot of it doesn't ring true. Um, sometimes the only thing we get from some of the contemporary versions of the life of St. Francis is he, he's the kindly little man with the birds in the garden. Uh, well, he certainly was a, a gentle man, a, a man that the, even the animals and birds responded to because of his great holiness. But Padre Pio, more than anything... Uh, was the, the living image of Jesus Christ, um, which, by the way, is a good working definition of what a saint is. Padre Pio made present Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
uh, we're all created in the image and likeness of God, and um, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, is Jesus. Padre Pio became more and more like Jesus in his time on earth. Uh, he loved God, and then out of that love for God, he loved souls. He loved all of humanity. He had great compassion, great empathy uh, for all human suffering. Uh, one of his great works was, a, was basically a, it's a spiritual work, but also a temporal work, uh, where both the spiritual and temporal works of mercy are manifested in his house for the relief of suffering. It's a great medical facility uh, that he built. And, um, he, he cared about those who were sick and suffering, and, and he met um, so many thousands of them and prayed for them and suffered for them. And also those who uh, suffered morally and spiritually, he had great compassion uh, for them as well. In his whole life was uh, an offering, an oblation to God, a sacrifice to God for the salvation of souls. Uh, we see this uh, manifest in his uh, uh, living out of the priesthood. Um, number one, uh, his great love for the Mass. Uh, that was the center of his existence. Uh, um, Indeed, it, the Holy Eucharist is the source, the center, and the summit of the church's life. And it should be of every single member of the church. It certainly was for Padre Pio. It was the source, the center, and the summit of his very existence. He lived to celebrate the Holy Mass each day. And he did it with such great, great reverence. Um, in addition to that, uh, the confessional. He certainly was a saint. Uh, of the confessional. He spent long, long hours in the confessional um, uh, absolving people from sin, setting captives free. Uh, Jesus, the high priest, working through the ministry of his servant and saint, uh, Padre Pio. And um, so many thousands would go, you know, there he was in the monastery, which he never left. He didn't go out preaching. Um, he, he was um, pretty much uh, not, not strict in closure, but he, he was in the monastery, and he was basically didn't, didn't leave it, except on very rare occasions um, uh, to visit his parents a, a, a couple of times. He, he'd go out to vote, by the way. Padre Pio would leave the monastery to go out to vote. He took very seriously uh, his civic obligation. Um, and in an election year, I'll just throw that in as a side note, take that very seriously. Uh, Padre Pio would certainly um, think well of that. So he was a priest of the Holy Mass, the confessional, uh, and, and of prayer. Um, he had a tremendous devotion to the rosary, great devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and to the, um, uh, to the messages of Fatima. Our Lady of Fatima, he thought very highly of these messages, and um, Our Lady exhorted us to pray the rosary, and Padre Pio prayed many rosaries every day. The uh, story has been frequently told that every now and then Padre Pio would yell out to the brothers, Bring me my weapon! Bring me my weapon! And they said, Father, your weapon? What weapon? My rosary! My weapon! A powerful weapon against evil. And so it was that he waged war on behalf of souls against the devil. You see, in the life of Padre Pio, as in the lives of so many saints, we see reality manifest. Now, today, this reality has often been uh, obfuscated. It's been diminished and distorted. But reality is not merely physical reality, not merely psychological reality. It's also spiritual reality. If you bracket out spiritual reality, you've bracketed out most of reality. Now, God is pure spirit. You eliminate God, who is being itself, and then try to draw conclusions about being <laughs> uh, good luck. You're not going to make it. But you see, in the life of Padre Pio, 
we see reality as it truly is manifest. Now, what I mean by that, the reality of good and evil, the reality of angels and of demons, a fierce combat swirled around Padre Pio. Uh, he, he was a great warrior, like his holy father, St. Francis, uh, who was at the beginning of his vocation shown that he would have to do combat with this horrible monster who was Satan. Uh, so Padre Pio, from the very beginnings of his religious and priestly vocation, he had frequent battles with the enemy. Uh, this is not pious fiction. Uh, this is not devotional Nonsense. This is rock-solid doctrine uh, evidenced in the life of a saint. Uh, and he's not the only saint that had these kinds of things. This is real. Heaven and hell are real. Good and evil are real. Satan and the fallen angels and the good angels, that's real. That's part of the doctrine of the faith. We believe this. You must believe this. If you refuse to believe this or doubt this, then God forbid you'd be classified as a heretic. That's part of what we believe in the doctrine of the faith. I'll guarantee you if you'd have lived in Padre Pio's shoes, you'd have believed it because he lived through it. How many times he suffered the assaults of the evil ones, at times even physically. This is an unusual thing. It's not an everyday thing. Uh, it's most likely not going to happen to you or to me, but it happens, and it happened to Padre Pio. Uh, it, it was a, uh, a manifestation of the hidden spiritual battle that goes on for souls. Uh, Padre Pio's life really demonstrates to us the essence of this battle. Now, sure, we, we know some of it now. Some of us, like me, we go out and we preach. And that's a good thing. We use the two-edged sword of the Word of God. That's a powerful weapon uh, for the salvation of souls. Padre Pio, through his uh, fervent, uh, zealous, and uh, very reverent celebration of the Holy Eucharist, uh, through his um, very efficacious hearing of confessions constantly, uh, minute after minute, month after month, year after year, thousands and thousands of confessions, reconciling souls to God. That, that's a great weapon, a fantastic weapon, powerful weapon against evil, confession. Uh, and then, possibly the greatest weapon of all, the cross of Christ. You know, when Jesus came to break the stranglehold of evil on humanity... Uh, he really didn't do it as a preacher. He didn't do it as a king. He didn't do it as a prophet. Uh, although all of those things contribute and are very important. He did it as a savior. And the way he did this was from a cross. Uh, pain and suffering ordained toward resurrection. Uh, it's the priesthood. It's the essence of the priesthood. The old covenant priesthood. All the pagan priests, priesthoods, that you know, all these religions, uh, whether the old covenant religion of the chosen people or the many different pagan religions, they all had a priesthood. And the substance of the old priesthood was the same. They offered a vicarious sacrifice uh, in atonement for sin or to appease their god or gods. Now, in the fullness of time, when God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law to deliver from the law those who were subject to it, that's Galatians 4.4, 4. it changed. The priesthood changed in essence. Uh, we have a, a coming to full stature of the authentic priesthood. Uh, and what that is, is the priest, now there's only one priest in the new covenant priesthood, you know, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the high priest. Every other priest, whether the ministerial priest like Padre Pio or myself and all the other ministerial priests we have, or the royal priest uh, of the faithful, the royal priesthood, that's all taken up in the one priest, Jesus Christ. And so the sum and substance of that is the priest, Jesus, offers sacrifice, but it's not a vicarious sacrifice. The, the priest offering is also the Lamb of God. 
the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. So priesthood and victimhood become one in the, in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And you see, Padre Pio lived this um, so perfectly, uh, the priesthood. Um, he offered sacrifice, first and foremost, the sacrifice uh, of Calvary, which we make present, the very same sacrifice made present in the holy sacrifice of the Mass in an unbloody manner. He made certainly that sacrifice as a priest, but he also incorporated himself, the sacrifice of himself. Uh, every moment of his life, all that he was, all that he did, everything was taken up in Jesus Christ, the high priest and Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. So priest and victim become one in Jesus. And Padre Pio lived this to the fullest. Um, he had the stigmata for 50 years. And, and by the way, uh, he wasn't canonized a saint because he had the stigmata. Um, as a matter of fact, when saints have these mystical uh, phenomenon, it take, usually takes longer for them to be canonized. Now, Padre Pio was canonized fast, uh, as those things are counted in the church, uh, very, very quickly, because there's great holiness, so many witnesses to it, so much fruit uh, from his life. Um, but uh, he wasn't canonized because of, of charisms. Um, a charism is one thing. Holiness is another. Saints are canonized because of heroic virtue. And so it was with Padre Pio. The exercise of heroic virtue. Uh, he prayed. He suffered. Uh, he engaged in, in work for the salvation of souls. Long, long hours in the confessional. Um, there are so many stories uh, about Padre Pio. He had a good sense of humor, you know. Uh, there are a lot of funny stories. I've known several people, by the way, who personally had met Padre Pio or, or knew him very well. Um, I recall fondly a, a gentleman that I knew when I was in the seminary, at Holy Apostle Seminary, uh, Joe Peterson. Uh, he knew Padre Pio, met him during the war, as many did during World War II. And uh, Joe was a mailman. And uh, every summer he'd take uh, his vacation to go over to Italy to visit Padre Pio. Uh, he was a mailman in Yonkers, New York, and Joe would take his, um, I think, a month off every summer. He'd fly over and, and, he'd, and he'd visit Padre Pio uh, at the friary over there. And Joe told me many stories uh, about his um, acquaintance and friendship with, with Padre Pio. He gave me a first-class relic, actually, one time. I treasure it to this day, a piece of uh, a glove from Padre Pio and some of the blood from the wounds of his hand. And uh, that's certainly something that uh, I'll always uh, treasure. But uh, Padre Pio had a great sense of humor, too. I remember uh, one of my, another one of my favorite saints, St. Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Jesus, her name in religion. She had a great sense of humor. And she used to say, um, God deliver us from somber saints. Uh, she had a sense of humor, too. And Padre Pio uh, was always... Uh, uh, he manifested that sense of humor. One time a woman, people used to, you know, want to uh, talk to him or, uh, or be blessed by him, which is understandable. One time uh, a woman uh, waited for him for, for hours, and uh, she uh, basically waited to ambush him in the corridor coming out of the friary into the church. And uh, she was all dressed up. She was a rather well-to-do woman dressed up in all kind of finery and jewelry, and uh, she ambushed Padre Pio on his way to the, the, the church, and, and she said, Padre Pio, today is my birthday. I'm 80. Say something to me. And he looked at her intently, and he said, death is near. And he walked off to the church. <laughs> it was, he, he, uh, he did indeed have a, uh, a sense of humor, and there are many stories uh, like that from the annals of Padre Pio. Um, you know, the, um, he had, a, as I mentioned, a great love for the rosary. He said so many rosaries. He had a tremendous devotion to the Blessed Mother. Uh, I am not familiar with any saint that didn't have 
great devotion to the Blessed Mother. And I'll go beyond that. Not just devotion. Relationship. Padre Pio had a real relationship with the Mother of God. She was his mother. Just like she's our mother. He interiorized that, though. She helped him uh, from, from his infancy. Uh, through so many trials, through so much suffering, all the combat with the devil. Uh, She was always there, and he had great love for her, great devotion. And uh, he manifests that devotion. You know, it's one thing to say you have devotion to the Blessed Mother. That's a great thing. I'm glad you do. But you need to have a relationship with her. Listen, if you have a relationship with her, um, you know, it's one thing to know where all of the the private revelations and apparitions took place and what she said here, there, and everywhere, that's okay. But better that you are like her. That's what's important. Number one, humility. She's the humble handmaid of the Lord. Uh, You know, practice humility. Um, Prayer, pray her rosary. Padre Pio was a humble man, a simple man, and a prayerful man praying thousands and thousands of rosaries throughout the course of his life. It it was indeed the gospel weapon which he used to do battle against the devil for the salvation of souls. We should do the the same. Learn uh, from the saints. Learn from Padre Pio. What should you learn from Padre Pio? Well, that. Listen, have great devotion to to your mother. You say, well, I have a hard time with the Blessed Mother. Well, get over it. Never mind a hard time. She's your mother. Jesus gave her to us from the cross. The least we can do is accept her. Accept her. You know, uh, you should have a, a picture or a statue of Our Lady in your home. Listen, if she's good enough for Jesus, she's good enough for you and me. And it's as simple as that. Or some people say, oh, I don't want to pay too much attention to her. She gets in the way of Jesus. Hogwash! The mother doesn't get in the way of the son. The mother leads us to the son. How did Jesus enter time and space? How did the word become flesh and dwell among us? It was through the fiat of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus came to us through Mary. Don't forget that. Jesus came to us through Mary. And if you really, you want to know a, a secret in the spiritual life, go to Jesus through Mary. Padre Pio did this. Go to Jesus through Mary. You may say, well, I can go direct. I don't need her. Arrogance. Arrogance. You know? Uh, she is more pure and holy than I am or that you are. Mary is the mother of the Lord. And she's our spiritual mother, too. Learn. From the saints, learn from Padre Pio. Have a great affection, a great love, a great devotion to the Blessed Mother and pray her rosary. Do it every day. Uh, God only knows how much we need these prayers in our country, in our church, in the world today. So pray that gospel prayer. Pray the rosary. Have great devotion to the angels. Padre Pio had great devotion to the holy angels, especially to his guardian angel. Uh, he used to tell people, send, t- tell, send your guardian angel to me. You know, remember what an angel is. The word means messenger. They're messengers. The angels carry messages from God to us and from us to God in the form of thoughts. And so, uh, you know, if you're, if you're struggling, if you're in trouble, whether physical, uh, psychological, moral, spiritual... Um, you know, sometimes you need to send out an SOS, right? Like a ship in distress, uh, in a storm on the ocean. Um, I've often sent my guardian angel to Padre Pio. I've often done that. I've all, often uh, enlisted the help of St. Michael to protect me, uh, St. Gabriel to strengthen me, St. Raphael to heal me. Uh, these are the great archangels, of course. Padre Pio had tremendous devotion to the angels. The angels are real. The angels have a powerful part to play in this dour combat that each one of us has to wage against the forces of evil. This is reality. Uh, You know, a good working definition of sanity 
is to be in touch with reality. If you're out of touch with God and things as they relate to God, the spiritual thing, then you're out of touch with reality. And, and you're, you know, you might not be all there. <laughs> so let's get in touch with reality. Padre Pio is a shining example of love for souls that comes from love for God. First of all, he loved God above all things for his own sake. That interchange of love gave him the power. It capacitated him to love souls, to love individual human beings with his whole heart, mind, and strength. He cared about people. He cared about individual human beings and all their sufferings. And you know, people do suffer so much. Uh, the longer I live, uh, the more I become aware of there's so many things a human being uh, has to suffer. You know, we've got physical things. Um, sure, some people far more than others. Um, psychological things, uh, psychological sufferings, emotional sufferings, can be every bit or more painful even than physical. Depression, anxiety, um, and certainly moral sufferings, the, the battle with sin that goes on throughout uh, the course of a human life, um, the spiritual sufferings. Padre Pio understood it because he went through all of it. He understood physical suffering. Listen, <laughs> he, had the, he, he had many sufferings through his life. He used to get high fevers that would break <laughs> the thermometer. Um, but after all, he had the, the, the stigmata, the wounds of Christ. You know, sometimes people ask, what are they? Well, they're real, the real wounds, nail holes, real holes in his hands and his feet and in his side, the five wounds of Christ. He had them. <clears throat> One time someone said to Padre Pio, said, do they hurt? And he looked at it, he looked at the guy in amazement and he said, what do you think, the decorations? Another time uh, on the 50th anniversary, of Padre Pio receiving the stigmata, they had a big party for him at the monastery. And a man came up to him, well-meaning, and said, uh, Oh, Padre Pio, may you have 50 more. And Padre Pio looked at him in horror and said, What did I ever do to you? You <laughs> 50 more years of pain in his hands and his feet and his side? Well, it was for a reason. Uh, he suffered physically. He suffered the... The, the physical sufferings of Jesus on the cross. And he suffered the abandonment that Jesus suffered on the cross. The father never, in fact, abandoned his son on the cross. But Jesus was allowed to feel, to experience total abandonment. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Those are really the words of the psalm. Uh, the father hadn't abandoned him, but he was allowed to suffer that darkness of soul. And Padre Pio experienced that. So in, in uniting himself with Jesus Christ and him crucified, the power of redemption was channeled through Padre Pio to souls. And then souls received grace. The grace to repent of their sins, the grace to go to confession, the grace to go on and live a good life and become something beautiful. For God. And that's the lesson from the life of St. Pio of Pietrocina. May he intercede for every one of us and for our families. Uh, may he pray for us at the throne of God. And may we strive to be more like him as we too put one foot after the other in the journey of life. God love you. God bless you. And goodbye.